this is uh, it's indeed a delight to to address this story here and and to start I suppose with uh, the father of us all at least here in in um, in America this is uh, Charles Wilson Peel uh, his self portrait he was also the um, the uh, founder of the first public museum in America, uh, a museum in Philadelphia. Uh, Charles Wilson uh, Peale is the kind of guy who named his children Rembrandt and Donatello. Uh, they also became painters. Uh, in this instance, you can see the kind of amazing uh, place this was. Uh, I don't know, it's a little bit bright here, but uh, Mastodon uh, jaws, stuffed uh, fowl of various sorts, uh, paintings, but also uh, 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 dioramas in a way, uh, all sorts of things. You, you, here he has his easel, uh, and uh, so he's a terrific character, only this talk is not about him. Uh, <laughs> uh, not Charles, Charles Wilson Peel, but a different Wilson. Um, in Los Angeles, there is, in, in uh, Culver City, on Venice Boulevard, Venice Boulevard ran from the beach uh, all the way downtown in LA, and they, there used to be a, a light rail system, and there used to be, at exactly the halfway point between the beach and downtown, there was a, a system of power, of the, the cables were actually being run at that point, and right across the street from that, Point is where there is a uh, nondescript part of the neighborhood. Uh, there's a carpet store. There's uh, on the other side. There's a mini mall. There's um, uh, there's a real estate office, although it's been abandoned. There's the Museum of Jurassic Technology. There's the uh, <laughs> Thai restaurant. There's the In and Out Burger. There's the Lou uh, the uh, body part body shop uh, for cars. And then you say, what? Uh, as I did at the time, uh, uh, many years ago now, where I would walk, go by there and I'd say, what? And uh, one time I went up and knocked on the door and nobody was there. Um, and I live in New York, but every time I came to LA, I'd, I'd go by. And by the way, it's only about 15 minutes from the LA airport. So if you're going through LA for any other reason, you can always get over there pretty easily. Um, Anyway, uh, occasionally there'll be this uh, gnomish little man outside uh, playing his accordion, um, um, playing uh, klezmer tunes or viol or Handel. Handel on the accordion is something to conjure with. Um, um, anyway, and that is indeed the founder of the place. Uh, David Wilson, um, and uh, if, if he is there, or if the door is open, he will enter. Um, mystified by the name, but no less mystified by coming indoors, because inside it is dark. It is labyrinthine. Uh, initially, it seemed a throwback to those uh, uh, Victorian natural history museums. There, it's uh, filled with with uh, uh, oak tables and glass vitrines and and uh, and very haunting lighting. Um, uh, uh, Wilson leaves you to it. There's a little sign at the front that says uh, suggested donation. In, in the old days, it was two dollars. I think it's now five dollars. Um, but he then assures you that that uh, it's free for people from the neighborhood. And then he says that he considers the bus, the bus bench outside to be part of the neighborhood. Um, anyway, so you're looking around, and you've come fairly early on to the Rose collection of now extinct French moths. And David may come up to you and say that there's a slight misnomer there because some of them are Flemish. <laughs> Um, 
there's a whole wing of the museum given over to uh, a display. This is the former studi study of uh, Jeffrey Sonnabend, um, a great uh, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s uh, neuropsychologist who, uh, in despair over the collapse of his uh, research into memory in carp, um, had a nervous breakdown um, and went to Iguazu Falls uh, a spa there in, uh, on the border of Brazil and, and Argentina to try to recover, um, or so David tells us. Um, there are all the way through the museum, by the way, there are the uh, acoustic guys you can listen to, little telephones you listen to, you hear these stories. In his case, uh, one night, um, uh, in, uh, he happened shortly after arriving at this spa to attend a uh, concert being given by Madeleine Delaney, uh, that's her up there, um, the famous uh, Romanian chanteuse and, and singer of Lieder uh, who uh, suffered from Korsakoff syndrome, uh, which is, to, well, we would now call that, which is to say she had no short-term memory, she had no memory at all. She was continually forgetting everything. The only thing she could remember were these songs, uh, which, however, she sang with what the New York Times described as a certain plaintive air. Um, and it was on uh, uh, hearing uh, Madalena Delaney that, that Sana Bent had this overwhelming uh, response. Uh, you know, sleepless night, he invented, he, he came upon his entire theory of obsolescence. Uh, or the theory of, of mat matter and the problem of forgetting. Um, his basic theory about memory, um, which was in a three-volume book, which David claims to have seen at the UCLA library, although the UCLA library claims never to have seen it. Um, <laughs> and when pressed on the issue, David says, yes, it's a very hard book to find. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, David says, David explains, and, and there's a huge display about this theory that, that basically memory is an illusion which we throw before ourselves uh, to disguise from ourselves the fact that we've in fact all forgotten everything. Um, there's all kinds of sub-details. It is three volumes long after all. Um, but uh, in fact, there's a whole side interest at the museum um, about memory and other famous memory uh, 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 Ebenhaus and other people who worked on memory. Uh, there's a, a similarly uh, questionable uh, uh, thing uh, about a French memory theorist uh, named Proust who, um, who believed that if you ate some cookies, you would just remember everything. Um, uh, the cookies, I have a French name that called Madeleines. Um, Madeleine Delaney. Mm. Um, <laughs> Anyway, and by the way, this particular thing, uh, there's these uh, three uh, buttons here, one, two, and three, and they're little pneumatic buttons, and if you press one, you get the smell of uh, dirty socks. Um, if you press another one, it's the smell of camphor, and another one, I forget what that one is, maybe it's the smell of cookies, for all I know. Um, in any case, it is quite amazing, the dirty sock one in particular, you do have all kinds of memories. Anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, there is a uh, wonderful display, one of my favorites at the museum, which is out of order, has been for some time, going on decades at this point, but um, it says out of order right there. It's some sort of uh, mechanical measuring device. It has this rotating table. There are five uh, little glass bowls with little pyramids of powder labeled one, two, three, four, five. Um, down here it says uh, what the five are. Uh, one is paranoia, two is delusion, three is schizophrenia, four is fantasy, and five is reason. And what's weird, the reason it's out of order is because the measuring device has come down on number five and it's all shattered. <laughs> it's all just shards and powder, and, which is pretty much what you are by the end of this museum. Um, <laughs> there's a whole fascinating exhibit uh, which begins with a uh, a beautiful slide. And by the way, I should say that David Wilson uh, creates these incredibly beautiful and haunting uh, environments, but also very, very beautiful uh, slideshows, dioramas, multi-dimensional slideshows, 
uh, on different glass screens that are different layers, and this, this one particular one is a, it begins with a tape of uh, Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, who, uh, after having discovered, it's a very scratchy tape, but it, you could hear him saying that after he had discovered penicillin, he remembered that in his youth, the old ladies in, in Wales, I believe is where he was from, um, anyway, had, had uh, when you were sick, had given uh, children moldy bread, which as you know, it, uh, it comes from Mullins, and so in that spirit, David has an entire wing of the museum given over to vulgar remedies, quote unquote, um, in the hopes that other scientists will stumble in and get ideas from, for example, uh, uh, duck's breath, um, which is that children in, in certain parts of the world, if they were beginning to have a respiratory infection, uh, were advised to put their mouths over a duck's bill and inhale the duck's breath and this would cure them. Um, some of you may remember the Duck's Breath Mystery Theater. Um, there's a whole series of mouse cures, uh, mouse pie, mice on toast. Uh, mouse pie is very good for people who stutter. Uh, mice toast, uh, mice on toast is advised for children who wet their beds. Um, I have no doubt it's, it's probably a cure for sleep. I, uh, <laughs> but uh, if you wet your bed, you eat that. I suppose that keeps you from wetting your bed again. Um, as I say, there, um, there, there are these little, wonderful little dioramas. I don't have the diorama here of this one piece, uh, which is uh, about the Cameroonian stink ant, but it's basically a, a, a diorama that you look inside and you pick up the phone, and it's kind of a jungle scene, and there's a little ant on one of the vines, and, and, the, and the, the phone explains, and, and by the way, the voice of institutional authority. This is the voice of, that on every acoustic guide, you know, the series. Um, and it explains that, that you're looking at a Cameroonian stink ant, one of the few ants whose scream is audible to the human ear. Um, and that it's part of a tribe of very industrious ants who roam the rainforest floor in uh, Cameroons and, and, and uh, West Africa. And every once in a while, one of these ants will accidentally inhale a spore from the genus Tomantella, um, raining down from somewhere in the canopy above. And if you happen, says the voice, to be at ant high level at that moment, you would see a look of bewildered stupefaction <laughs> on the face of the ant, as well you might, because the spore immediately goes to its brain and begins to, and lodges there, and begins to foment bizarre behavioral changes. For the first time in its life, the ant loses its industrious drive, and kind of staggers around, confused for a while, and then begins to climb the vines, or the tendrils of the vines, uh, for the first time ever, uh, for, for no apparent reason, and it climbs into a certain height, um, where it impales its mandibles on the vine, uh, and waits to die because indeed the spore is eating up its entire uh, internal system. Um, at the end of two weeks, uh, a horn, a prong, suddenly erupts from out of the forehead of the ant, heavy laden with spores which now rain down upon the rainforest floor for uh, other unsuspecting ants to inhale. I said to David, where'd you hear about that? <laughs> he, said, um, he said, well, you know, it's, it was, I think, an, an, an issue of Scientific American, but we lost it. Um, and, and, uh, and he said, but we always liked that story because it, it kind of, it feels like us. We, we feel like we've inhaled a spore, and we don't know why we're doing this, but you know, the whole theme of prongs and, and things, uh, Horns is a big theme. Uh, for that matter, by the way, a big part of the theory of, of Sonnevin was that it was the cone of confabulation, which is also known as the horn of memory. Uh, so then there's this one, and then there's also an entire antler wall, which is the kind of thing you see at every natural history museum. Only uh, in this case, there's this ant. Oh, that happened. What did I do? Okay, now I'm, now I'm in trouble. Oh dear, okay, well, let's, don't worry, we're going to get there, we're, we're going to get there, just a second. 
Yeah. See if you can remember it. It's all be on the test. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's right. Which number? Five. Five. Very good, okay. What's that? Very good, what's that? Nice. Nice. Very good, okay, what's that? There we are. Um, and here's the answer wall, okay. And um, I was trying, what I was trying to do is show you that and read you this. What this says underneath that is, we were shown an extraordinarily curious horn. This is a quote from, uh, by the way, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it, 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 it's just in quotes, actually, but it doesn't even tell you where it's quote. Uh, from the uh, uh, early visitor to the Museum Trades Cantiantum, the Ark. We were shown an extraordinary curious horn which had grown on the back of a woman's head. It is somewhat of a curiosity, for it appears that menfolk bear their horns in front and such women theirs behind. It was noted on the label that it originated from a Mary Davis of Sawhall in Cheshire when she was 71 years old in the year 1688. Um, and you say, okay, um, you look at it more carefully, it seems, uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, you're not quite sure. Uh, then there's all kinds of microscopic things. Um, I should say, by the way, there's all sorts of, of uh, catopter things where you look through, through lenses and you know, on the other side it doesn't seem to be there, but it is there, you can't tell what's going on. There's prisms, there's, so you never know quite what's going on when you're looking at anything. And in this case, there are microscopes, and you look through them, and there's the eye of a needle uh, upon which somebody has carved uh, goofy and painted. If that's in fact what you're looking at, you can't quite really see. It's kind of tiny, and or Napoleon inside the eye of a needle. Uh, as you know, Napoleon was small. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I asked uh, David about this, and he said that it was a uh, they had gotten these from a Armenian violinist emigre uh, named Hagov Sandaljan, and I asked whether I could perhaps interview him, and David said, unfortunately, he had died just before the show opened. Um, finally, I mean, I could go on for hours. This thing is very labyrinthine. It has metastasized deep into the building. You can't figure out what's going on. There's all these little side calls and so forth. But, um, um, the, uh, I'll just give you one other example here, which is this label for this particular exhibit here. We're looking at this, and this is this. And that there says fruit stone carving, as you can see. And the label reads, almond stone. The front is carved with a Flemish landscape in which is seated a bearded man wearing a beretta, a long tunic of classical character, and thick-soled shoes. He is seated with a viol held uh, between um, his knees, wh wh which he tunes while well, he tunes one of the strings. In the distance are representations of animals, uh, including a lion, a bear, an elephant ridden by a monkey, a boar, a dog, a donkey, a stag, a camel, a horse, a bull, da 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 da, da a squirrel. On the back is shown an unusually grim crucifixion. <laughs> that, by the way, is why there's that mirror there, so you can see that. Um, so obviously, without further ado, you figure this out. This is a this wonderful place is a wonderful postmodern send up of museums. You know, why do we ever believe labels? Why do we believe that voice of institutional authority? Uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, for, for a while, for several visits, I began to figure out that I'd figured that out. That's what we were, that's what we were dealing with here as part of that whole wonderful question authority thing that's been going on basically since the 60s uh, and is, 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 is cool. So, but anyway, the, I thought that for a long time um, and then kind of began to realize that no, that was not what this was. That in fact, this wasn't so much postmodern as pre-modern, as Petra suggested that in fact the postmodern has its roots in the pre-modern. By the pre-modern I mean the 16th and 17th century when uh, all over Europe uh, in the 1500s and the 1600s you would find every gentleman had his wonder cabinet um, filled with completely strange and odd objects uh, 
uh, we nowadays say, which had kind of no totally logical latency of any kind of rhyme or reason. On the contrary, they had a tremendous rhyme or reason. It's just not our rhyme and reason, so we don't relate to them necessarily. Um, uh, but uh, for example, in 1599, um, Thomas Platter, a Swiss visitor uh, to London, went to Sir Walter Cope's um, uh, uh, antiquary cabinet in Kensington, which fe featured, in, according to his diary, an apartment stuffed with queer foreign objects in every corner, including, among other things, holy relics from a Spanish ship, which a Cope had helped to capture, earthen pitchers and porcelain from China, a Madonna made of feathers, a chain made of monkey teeth, stone shears, a back scratcher, and a canoe with paddles, all from India, quote unquote. Um, a Japanese costume, Arabian coast, the horn and tail of a rhinoceros, the horn of a bull seal, a round horn that had grown on an English woman's forehead. <laughs> um, a unicorn's tail, the baubles and bells of Henry VIII's fool. Um, well, that sort of thing. Or to give you another example, uh, in this case, we're dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, the Edward Brown, uh, who travels through Europe and eventually gets to Leipzig, where he visits the wonder cabin of Herr von Andershaun, which included, uh, as he puts, but a few of the things I will mention, an elephant's head with a dentes molaris in it, a seahorse, Bread of Mount Labinus, a cedar branch with fruit upon it, large granites as they grow in the mine, a siren's hand, the Isle of Jersey drawn by our King Charles II, a piece of wood with the blood of King Charles I upon it, he was one who was beheaded, you know. um, beavers taken in the River Elbe, a picture of the murder of the innocents done by Albert Dorr. And one of the things that's quite fascinating about it, you can get a sense of it here as well, is that right alongside these strange things, these micro these beetles or shells, or, or for that matter, uh, incredible things of craft. Uh, this was a piece of ivory which had been, uh, the inside had been carved with another piece of ivory, with another piece inside, 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 uh, or by the way, horns up here, uh, but coral attached. This is a cheat. This is clearly coral, and it's clearly glued to the skull. But you know, uh, there's lots of uh, fraud, by the way, going on in these things too. But uh, but you had marvels of. It was all about marvel. It was all about wonder. It was about both the wonders of nature, but also the wonders of human craft, uh, uh, of art, of the incredible ability of human beings to make illusionary art. This is this is as strange that somebody could do this as, as, uh, as a dissected eye. I mean, there's all kinds of things that were going on, and they were all thrown together in the same place because they all were to the greater glory of God, the mar uh, indications of, of wonder. Um, and this is all before this exceedingly strange separation that occurs later on in the Enlightenment between you know, uh, industrial history, art history, natural history, all that is it seems to me that's the thing you have to wonder how that happened, not, not why this was all happening. But anyway, uh, and indeed we've seen, uh, we've already seen this one here, uh, which is uh, Fernando and Horato's Wonder Cabinet uh, in Naples. Uh, or, uh, um, or actually, no, excuse me, that, that was not that. This is Fernando and Horato's. By the way, do you see all these things? I love how they have, you know, the the alligators on the ceiling, they have you know, <coughs> narwhal tusks, they have uh, stuffed pelicans, shells, uh, presumably lively do uh, live dogs, although perhaps stuffed. And for that matter, by the way, I once read somebody who was speculating that, that the dwarf, who was the curator of this collection, was stuffed after he died. Uh, <coughs> So whether this is a picture before or after that, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> uh, but a question arises, um, why there was this sudden overwhelming taste for the marvelous at that moment in history. It really starts around 1500, and it goes till around 1650, 1675. By the end of this period, People are beginning to have doubts about it. Uh, there's been so much fraud and so forth, and you're beginning to have the beginnings of the scientific method and so forth. But there's this incredible period 
of a, a, a huge upwelling of marvel, uh, of the taste for marvel. Um, and I would suggest to you that the reason is, and I'm not alone in the suggestion, uh, the discovery of America. Uh, here we have a contemporary print of Christopher Columbus on his way to America with all the sirens in the sea, as you can see them, and so forth. Um, and uh, Columbus landing. Columbus in his journals is continually, and his letters back to the queen and the king, king and queen, is continually you know, just being amazed. I wondered at this, I marveled at this, I admiram, admiram. And, and uh, I admired. Uh, uh, the Queen at one point quit that they should stop calling him the Admiral, they should call him the Admirant, the one who wonders, um, one who marvels. Uh, it's also obviously the case that one of the, the effects, uh, one of the nice things about marveling at everything you see is that it, you can spend so much time marveling at all these Indian customs that you don't notice that you're wiping the Indians out. Um, so there's a kind of uh, usefulness to all that marvel in, 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 uh, in, the, in the mental, the psychological economy of what was going on. But having said that, Europe is blowing, uh, I mean, America, and for that matter, Africa and so forth, is blowing Europe's mind. All this stuff is coming over the transom. Purple parrot feathers. I mean, uh, uh, <coughs> moose antlers, uh, uh, sacrificial urns and so forth. Uh, and and uh, it just, uh, in fact, one of the things that's interesting, it, 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 it countenances belief in all sorts of stuff that used to be fabulous. Um, um, one of the point, I mean, uh, there's this sudden vogue for having your heart tremble at something. Um, uh, here we have, uh, by the way, this is, uh, Europeans <coughs> marveling at a stag sacrifice among Indians. But this is an illustration from uh, Jean de la Riche, uh, his history of a voyage to the land of Brazil, uh, a history in which he recounts uh, all these strange creatures that that uh, that he claims to have seen, uh, you know, uh, bears with the heads of, of people. There's uh, 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 men who have uh, faces in their stomachs, all sorts of weird things. Um, and in his journal, by the way, this is a journal that Claude Levi Strauss is reading when he's writing Tris Tropique, um, and uh, considered one of the great uh, early uh, anthropological texts. But uh, there he writes, Whenever I remember it, my heart trembles. Stephen Greenblatt has a wonderful book called Marvel's Possessions, and he notes that this trembling is the authentic sign of wonder. Uh, for wonder, as Albertus Magnus wrote, is like a systole in the heart. Someone witnesses something amazing, but what matters most is not out there, but deep within, at the vital emotional center of witness. Um, and then the thing that's very interesting is, at the out outset of his own account, um, Larry asks, how his French readers can be made to believe what can only be seen 2,000 leagues from where they live, things never known, much less written about by the ancients, things so marvelous that experience itself can scarcely engrave them on the understanding. And more to the point, what happens is people begin to say, Sir Walter Raleigh says, I know you can't uh, believe this, but I saw it, and it makes me all the things that I had come to doubt uh, in earlier stories, I suddenly have to think, well, maybe they're true after all. So what you have a very strange thing happening here, which is that uh, there's a fantasy that knowledge proceeds progressively all the time, but in fact what's happened here is you have to have a tremendous amount of positive, positivist scientific knowledge to make that trip about the stars, about navigation, about shipbuilding, about astrolabs, I mean, I mean all kinds of things to be able to make that trip to America. But once you got to America, you saw all this weird stuff, and, it made, and there's this kind of backsliding that happens where you start to say, well, you know what, maybe, Maybe, you know, I mean, we now have narwhal tusks, sea unicorn, sea tusks by these animals. So if that's there, why can't there be unicorns? There must be unicorns. And for that matter, there must be human horns. Why not? You know, and, and, and it's a little bit like my daughter, uh, who when she was 
uh, five years old, believed in Santa Claus. When she was six, she didn't believe in Santa Claus. And when she was seven, she believed in Santa Claus more fervently and more elaborately and more with baroque, rococo things uh, than she'd ever believed before. I mean, the, the, it is not at all that you just kind of go simply. And the history of civilization is, is similarly uh, uh, fraught with this sort of, uh, of wonderful thing. Um, so that, at any rate, you, you had this fascination with America. In this instance, uh, uh, this is from a beautiful illustrated uh, text showing Indians stalking deer disguised as deer <laughs> with their bows and arrows. Um, you had what we've seen before, the Museum Or Ornianum of, of Elias Worm. So this is his real name, Elias Worms, big museum in Copenhagen with all the narwhal tusks and so forth. You have harpoons and narwhal tusks and, uh, and polar bears, white bears. Where, I mean, you know, who knows what else could be in the world? Um, in Holland, this began to, uh, I mean, one of the things that's also fascinating here is that we're at the, we're at the cusp between, uh, between pre-science and science. We're kind of stumbling toward scientific method. And that some of the same people who will become the founders of anatomy of meteorology and so forth, or at the same time making these strange collections. So, so and in, in different tempers in different countries. In Holland, there was in Calvinist Protestant Holland, there was a whole moralizing temper. So you would have anatomy theaters, literally theaters, uh, where people would go on a Sunday afternoon. And, and there's all kinds of uh, moralizing here. You have uh, the uh, the skeleton of Adam being offered a apple from the skeleton of Eve from the twig of knowledge here. Uh, you have a horse, a skeleton of a horse with a skeleton of a horse thief. Basically, don't steal is what it's saying. You know, there's all these kind of moral lessons and so forth. And then you have uh, Frederick Reusch, who uh, was making these absolutely astonishing um, uh, kind of uh, little sculptures out of this is, a, this is a drawing of, in fact, a sculpture that, uh, that he put together out of uh, skeletons of fetuses. He was an anatomist. Uh, let me read you the uh, text which, which described this, a contemporary text. With eye sockets churned heavenward, the central fetus, a skeleton, a fetus of about four months, uh, chants a lament on the misery of life. Ah, fate, a bitter fight, fate it sings, accompanying itself on a violin made of osteomyelitic sequester with a dried artery for a bow. At its right, a tiny skeleton conducts the music with a baton set with minute kidney stones. In the right foreground, a stiff little skeleton girdles its hips with injected sheep intestines, its right hand grasping a spear made of the hard and vast deference of an adult man, grimly conveying the message that its first hour was also its last. Uh, and there's a mayfly here, which famously only lives. So this is a, this is a little pile of gall, of, of gallstones and so forth. Um, and uh, Reusch, um, uh, for all this kind of insane vanitas kind of stuff, uh, was also. And as if you if you're an anatomist, you know that he is the founder of anatomy. Uh, I mean, he's a major major person who was putting together all kinds of early things about anatomy. Uh, here you see him giving a, a, a dissection. Uh, this is uh, him there dissecting. Uh, this is not clear whether this is his son or his daughter uh, uh, with, the, with, with, their, with the child's doll. Um, <laughs> his daughter, Rachel Royce, uh, for all of uh, Frederick Royce's stuff about the briefness of life, he lived to be into his 90s as did his daughter, Rachel. Rachel Royce is one of the foremost painters of uh, floral still lives. Uh, uh, and in fact, the richest artist of her time. These were incredibly popular, much more popular than Rembrandt or Vermeer. Uh, Rachel Royce here, we could go on to do that. Uh, but the point is, in much the way that he is doing that, uh, another uh, person of this age of wonder is Isaac Newton, here seen doing his famous uh, experiments with prisms and light. Um, he, of course, is, is doing the Principia. He's figuring out incredible amounts of stuff. But at the very same time, um, and not in the early phases of his life, but throughout his life, he was doing alchemical experiments, uh, gathering all these different minerals and so forth in, in wonder cabinets, from wonder cabinets, so that he could do experiments trying to turn lead into gold and so forth. 
there are, uh, is, are millions and millions of words, of hundreds of thousands of pages of his alchemical notes, which he preserved, uh, which he donated to Cambridge along with all his other notes, and thought is continuous with everything else he was doing. Uh, uh, when he, 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 he is spending a lot of time hanging out with capitalists, talking to them about, about uh, uh, infinity, trying to figure out the mind of God, the infinite, and stumbles upon the infinitesimal, the calculus. All this stuff is related to each other, uh, and when John Maynard Keynes, in the middle of the Depression, when he had much more important things to do, stumbled upon these alchemical notes at the Cambridge Library, he took a six-month vacation from his financial uh, urgencies and uh, wrote a biography of Newton, which culminated with the phrase, we're going to have to completely reevaluate re our, our thinking about Newton. He is not the, uh, the first of the moderns. He is the last of the Sumerians. Um, at any rate, uh, I suddenly began to realize that this is the world out of that David Wilson seemed to be channeling. By the way, David Wilson won't talk to you, so I mean, he, or he's, he'll be extremely polite, but he's extremely, as you might have gathered, uh, uh, Delphic, and uh, he never breaks irony. Um, <laughs> so you can't actually figure out what's going on. But uh, I began reading up on these things, and, and one day I was reading a, uh, a, the catalog of the Tredescant collection, which is the basis for the Ashmolean Museum, the great museum in Oxford. Um, and I was looking in the catalog, and I came upon um, the description of a little tiny fruit stone carving, uh, which read, uh, fruit stone, almond stone, the front is carved with a Flemish landscape. Um, <laughs> In which a seated man, bearded man wearing a beret over long hair, long tunic, da da da. The back is filled with representations of animals, including a lion, a boar, a elephant, ridden by, and they are all there at exactly the same size as the thing in the museum. Which got me to thinking about Sandalgen, uh, Hagop Sandalgen, you know, the, the, uh, the guy who did the, uh, the, uh, uh, sculpted micro miniatures and I began calling up in the neighborhood he came from, I think Alhambra or something, and began calling around and eventually uh, called, turned out he had died, and I reached his daughter. She said, oh no, no, it's all true, no, 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 it's completely true. Uh, uh, our father uh, uh, was an immigrant, uh, Armenian, uh, here he is a sculpture. He would, he, she said he would carve hair the way Michelangelo would carve a block. Of, of, uh, of marble, um, and uh, he had, you know, he invented these tiny little tools. He'd do it under a microscope. Uh, he uh, he would suspend his breathing when he was working. He would time his applications of the blade. Blades he made out of shattered little tiny, tiny, tiny dust particles of diamonds. Uh, he would uh, he would time his applications of the blade or the brush between his heartbeats. Uh, you know, I, we were an immigrant family, uh, it took me a few years to catch up with my school. I arrived when I was 10, but when I was 12, I came running home from school one day to tell my father that I'd, I'd gotten uh, three A's on my report card, and I blasted into his, uh, into his studio and blew away six months of his work. Uh, um, he died, we haven't, we've sealed his study because we're fairly sure there's all kinds of work in there, but we can't figure out where it is. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most amazing thing she said, uh, uh, this is by the way, uh, a, his three week old nephew's hair with other hairs from the family painted as birds. Uh, and the thing that's apparently was truly amazing was his, micro, his discovery of ways to do paint in microscopic emulsions because because a single drop of paint would completely wipe out of things, so you had to figure out a way to make paint that in such tiny little droplets. Here we see Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, micro miniature dwarfs. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course we see John Paul um, uh, waving to us or blessing us from the eye of a needle. Um, one day I was, was there, um, and they had a visiting show from uh, the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, which has all kinds of wonderful, crazy things that's uh, worth going to. And as I was leaving, uh, as I was, I was late for a plane, and I was in a hurry to leave, 
and there was one little uh, exhibit that I passed. Uh, this is a this is a museum of, of real uh, 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 medical freaks and oddities and so forth. And in this case, this is a human horn. So go figure. Um, it turns out that human horns, anomalous growths consisting entirely of concentric layers of keratinized epidermal cells, keratin is like your fingernails, uh, with a tendency to originate on sites of sebaceous cysts, warts, or scars, are far more frequent than ordinarily supposed, according to doctors George Gould and Walter Pyle, um, in a book called Anomalies and Curiosities of Medicine. Um, they cite the 1820 case of a Paul Rodriguez, a Mexican porter, who had from the upper and lateral part of his head a horn 14 centimeters in circumference, um, was constantly wearing a cap, uh, of a peculiar red sh a peculiarly shaped red cap. Um, I read about other people. Uh, there was a French peasant uh, brought before a regional magistrate on September 18th. 1598 for refusing to remove his hat in the presence of a nobleman. Forced to do so in a court, he uncovered a well-developed ram's horn, which he explained had begun to grow when he was five. The magistrate packed him off to see the king, who, according to one of the chroniclers, sought to breed him with the courtesans. <laughs> After a few months of this life, the poor fellow unfortunately gave up the ghost. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, Monastier also cites the example of Francois Trouillou, uh, who was quite proud of his horn, which closely resembled a panache. <laughs> a panache. Um, perhaps the most famous case is that of uh, the uh, widow Dimanche, uh, uh, widow Sunday, uh, who had this rather astonishing uh, horn. Um, he read, I mean, the point is, this was incredibly fascinating. It's always been fascinating. An object of tremendous wonder to people about horns. Um, and indeed, uh, as you keep on reading, I'm now back in this Tradescan catalog about the Ashmolean, you come upon the case of one Mary Davis of Sawhall, um, who, uh, according to the catalog of the Ashmolean, she is a Cheshire midwife, and she cast off several pair of horns during her life, each set larger than the ones before, in shoe and substance much like ram's horns, according to a contemporary pamphlet. Solid and wrinkled, but sadly grieving the old woman, especially upon the changes of weather. Uh, this here is a contemporary portrait. It says this is a portraiture of Mary Davis, an inhabitant of Greater Salchester, when she said, basically, and, oh, actually, let me read this to you. When, uh, when she was 28 years old, she had an excrescence upon her head, which continued 30 years. Like to a when, then she grew, then grew into two horns. After three point eight years, she cast them. Then grew two more. After four years, she cast those. Uh, these upon her head have grown four years and are loose. <laughs> loose. Um, and by the way, this is not only something that uh, happened in the distant past. Um, I called the head of the Dermatological Society, um, who, was, who, was, who was just about to retire, he was like in his 80s, the, the American College of Dermatologists, and he said, oh yeah, we used to get that kind of thing all the time. Um, yeah, no, I remember one day, uh, this, uh, we don't get them that much anymore because people, you know, surgically remove them as they get started, or else just with, with washing, you wash, knock them off as they get started. But, Oh, no, no, one day this kid, this woman came in and she had a, or am I confabulating? <laughs> you couldn't remember when this had actually happened. Um, <laughs> this is a, an old picture from the Photographic Record of Medicine, uh, 1888. Uh, uh, this is an old sea captain who, uh, I should read you what it says here. Um, let's see here. Uh, this 78-year-old retired sea captain sought medical attention advice because his horny growths broke off, and he wanted the physicians to reattach them. <laughs> they were attached again with string for this photograph only, and the patient advised remove them. So anyway, you can see. Um, anyway, it turns out that horns and the horny have been very much on people's minds all the way back to 
the origins of medicine in the pre-Hippocratic period. Um, um, and uh, the master uh, text on this uh, is uh, R. B. Onions, uh, the great English uh, um, um, uh, anthropologist of language in some sense. Norman O. Brown, my master at Santa Cruz, used to always talk to us about Onions and, and, uh, and Onions' book, which is called The Origin, and by the way, I really recommend this book, just write down this title, it's a good title. The Origins of European Thought About the Body, the Mind, the Soul, the World, Time, and Fate. <laughs> and what Onions um, uh, basically was able to figure out from the language was that the Greeks believed, and this is a belief that continues well in, into uh, Hellenistic and early modern period, that the fluid around the brain was the same as spinal fluid, which was semen, and, uh, or, or uh, was uh, you know, vaginal uh, uterine fluids. And we know that's, still, that's because it's in the language. Uh, uh, cereal, seed, cerebellum. Cerebrum, um, and and uh, uh, for that matter, genes, genius, horn, horn of plenty, corn, horn, uh, crown, karyas, uh, as in aristocracy, the, the the governing thing, which is which is uh, uh, has all kinds of. Uh, 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 becomes crown and, and so forth. Uh, the soul substance is the seminal substance. <coughs> the genius is the genital. And we had, by the way, also hysteria, hysterectomy, all that stuff is, uh, so that Freud is suddenly just basically unpacking what's already in the language. Um, um, for that matter, English horn is Latin cornu, uh, is English uh, Greek keras, horn, is English kern, kernel. Here I'm again with Norman Brown now. Um, uh, the uh, in in Kern the horny hunter. Or let me go. But cornu horn in, is corona crown. Keras horn is Greek cross, English cranium. Greek kratos a head of power and authority, aristocracy democracy cranium cranium to authorize. Hearn the Horny Hunter, Falstaff's name in the uh, Merry Wives of Windsor, is from German, Hearn, which is brain. Hearn was brainy, like a horned Moses, crescent, cresting, a swollen or horny head. In other words, this is an early theory of the horny, of, uh, uh, of the brainy and so forth. Um, this comes. This whole thing comes from a essay uh, of Norman o. Brown's on Acteon, who turns out to have been an enormously popular figure in the wonder, in the age, in the Elizabethan age, and in the age of wonder and the age of marvel, marvel, in the Elizabethan imagination. The Elizabethans got their Acteon from Ovid, uh, or more specifically from Arthur Golding's 1567 translation of the Metamorphoses. Uh, a text which Ezra Pound wants praised as the most beautiful book in the language. In Golding's rendition, Acteon was out hunting in the forest with his hounds when he happened to catch a glimpse of Artemis Diana bathing with her maid. So there we have uh, Acteon, and here uh, we have uh, uh, Diana. Diana is the goddess uh, of the hunt, uh, of the moon. She's the virgin goddess. Golding calls her Phoebe. Um, and she's bathing in a pool with her nymphs. Drawn by the extraordinary vision, Acteon approaches silently, stealthily, pulling aside the intervening branches. But he is seen. The damsels at the sight of man, quite out of countenance, dashed, because they every one were bare and naked to the quick. That's Golding. But Phoebe, of personage, uh, Phoebe, of personage so comely and so tall that by the middle of her neck she overpeered them all, stands her ground fiercely defiant. Though she had 
her guard of nymphs about her, yet she turned her body from him ward, and casting back an angry look, like as she would have sent an arrow at him had she had her bow there ready bent, she wrought, so wrought she water in her hand, and for to wreak the spite, besprinkled all the head and face of that unlucky knight. At which point his fate is already sealed. She thus, she thus forspake the heavy lot that should upon him light. Now make thy vaunt among thy mates. Thou sawst Diana bear. Tell it thou can, I give thee leave. Tell hardly, do not spare. This done, she makes no further threats, but by and by doth spread a pair of lively old hearts horns upon his sprinkled head. As yet unknowing, Acteon scampers off, trots in Galding's beguiling parlance. And it's only when he comes upon a brook and gazes upon his own reflection in the water that he realizes what is happening, that he is being turned into a stag himself. And presently, being pursued by his own hounds to his death. Of course, in our context, we will understand the story of acting on his fate for, for what it is, a wonder narrative and a cautionary tale, um, a story of possession. Watch out for what you see. No sooner had Ovid himself completed his metamorphoses in the, the year 8 AD than he himself appears to have inadvertently witnessed something untoward, something sexual, something political. He doesn't say, and we will never know. A calamitous misprison uh, for which the great Augustus Caesar condemned him to eke out the remainder of his days in a terrible exile along the farthest reaches of the empire and what is now Romania. Oh, why did I see what I saw? The poet would be decrying his uncanny fate a few years later, in book two of his Tristia. Acteon never intended to see Diana naked, but still was torn to bits by his own hounds. Antlers, from the French ant oeille, in the place of eyes. Or the German Ogensprouts, eye sprouts. Uh, when Chaucer's friend John Gower sang his version of the story in his Confessio Amantis, also based on Ovid, though 200 years before Golding, he cast Acteon's face, a fate, as an ensemble portioned of mixed look, which is like a ten-way pun. First of all, it's a, it's a touching example of mis, of mixed look, but touch end. So it ended. His, it was the touching, but it was the end of touch for him but also of misluck, because indeed uh, Acteon had had the bad luck to misluck at Lady Luck, as might anyone risk to do gazing too long, too helplessly at wonder, not that it wouldn't necessarily be worth it. <laughs> Just ask the ant. <laughs> that is entirely true. Um, and. Uh, I will then a slideshow which uh, PowerPoint has its origins in Athanasius Kirker, the, great, the greatest wall wonder cabinet people, who was also a great inventor and invented the slide projector, as you can see here, with its horn of light. <laughs> and uh, uh, you would have a lamp. It's exactly the same technology you can see. You know, a lamp, and you have a lens, and then you project it on. Um, Italo Calvino. Uh, Ends his if a uh, if a if on a winter or in his if on a winter's night a traveler. At one point it says, "To my astonishment, they take me home rather uh, than to some secret hideaway and lock me in the catoptric room I had so carefully reconstructed from Athanasius Kircher's drawings. The mirror walls return my image an infinite number of times. Had I been kidnapped by myself?" Thank you. Questions?
as soon as you like. Yeah, way in the back. But loud. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> All right. I, I just had one comment on the viewing experience at the LA Museum. Uh -huh. It's just extraordinarily dark in there. Oh, yeah. And I, I think it, it obviously to uh, accommodate the fragility of some of the objects on display mandates that, but it also adds to that tremendous sense of secrecy and also discovery. And I was thinking about that, especially when you were talking uh, about the displays that had to do with memory, the sense of going back in the dark, which we all do mentally, you know, right. is kind of complemented by the way uh, the museum is laid out in terms of its labyrinth and plan, as you said, but also that overwhelming sense of, of darkness. Of darkness and of, I think you would say, uh, of slippage. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not quite sure what's going on, and, and it's, the darkness is probably you're afraid you're going to slip, literally, uh -huh. but, but you're also, I mean, one of the things that he even talks about is that it's, there's, a, there's something useful to cracking the shell of certainty. Um, that uh, the, the, when I showed you that picture of uh, the uh, the ant, that was a picture. Um, uh, that I got from Tom Eisner, the great, great, uh, I had called him to just tell him these hilarious things that were going on at the museum, and he was cracking up laughing, and he said, you know, that's so great, when you're a scientist, the really fun part is when you're just throwing out hypotheses, wilder and wilder hypotheses, later on you've got to get serious, you've got to nail things down, but the great part of being a scientist is when you're just throwing out these hypotheses, and that's what, what that, that kind of, of delight in lack of certainty. Uh, uh, and the and the vertigo of lack of certainty is one of the great great things, and 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 it is an opening of the things, um, and that in some ways is is another way of talking about the pre-modern origins of the postmodern. Uh, to go back and celebrate that lack of certainty. Uh, other questions? Yeah, right here. Yeah. Uh you were talking about if I understood you correctly that uh, and if I understood myself correctly, I mean we're all we're all we're all here together. <laughs> now, uh, yeah. um, you were talking about the cabinets of curiosity as they were formed by the people who right. them, individual homes as well as large collections, mm -hmm. that there was a narrative, but we may not know it, mm -hmm. uh, uh, attached to that uh, to that collection. Mm -hmm. that, am I the that? way I, the way I would phrase it is that they had there were reasons to organize things. But so for example, they would organize uh, carrots that broke in half, uh, or, you know, two two-sided carrots with two-headed goats, uh, with, uh, with uh, they would put it side by side with shells that had two bi you know, bivalve shells. They would put all these things together as an organizing principle. That was a, and, and later on, when you get to the taxonomy, no, 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 you don't put carrots together with goats. Those were Things and it's like different things are going on, but in fact, they're onto something. Um, and 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 another way of putting it is, I would say that that, that they that they there was tremendous senses of ordering. They just aren't our ways of ordering. And our, and I assure you, I mean, I don't mean to be relativistic about this, but I assure you that our ways of ordering are going to look completely absurd to people 500 years from now. Are, but the, are there written instances of people talking about this? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, but they don't say they they would not say my way of ordering is this. They would express their order. You know, they, right. they, they, so, yeah. so our yeah. visual take on their cabinet uh -huh. would be our inference about their order. Yeah, system, yeah. But they would not have necessarily written it down until it got more you know, organized. Well, as as it begins to get as it begins to get organized, uh, you and as you're struggling to organize it and to articulate what the order is, you begin to have. A movement toward what will become taxonomy, conventional taxonomy, uh, but this is, it is struggling to be born in the mix of this onslaught of completely wild stuff that's coming over the transom. So it's it's a, it's an amazing period. By the way, if I were going back if I, to the students I'm going to here, uh, 17th century intellectual history, hands down, the coolest thing to study. I mean, it, it is just it is wild what's going on in the 17th century. You know, and 18th century not boring. Uh, that is really, really interesting where they are stumbling toward this. And, uh, else? Right here. Has uh, you considered the possible relationship between opium and the cabinet of curiosity? The question is, have I, have, uh, I considered the relationship between opium and the cabinet of curiosity? 
Um, I would say uh, several things about that. I mean, among the things that are coming over the transom are all sorts of strange drugs. Uh, and by the way, when a lot of that time when I was saying India, that could be, as well be China, it could be America, I mean, they, it, was, it could be Africa. Um, and I would, the flip side I would say is that it is not surprising that it is in the 60s, 70s, 80s after marijuana and, and so forth that you get a, a, a new taste for, for this. Um, I would suggest, off the top of my head, I don't know the history of opium uh, when it first arrives in Europe, but what one thing that arrives in Europe in a big, big way with the discovery of America's tobacco and smoking. And by the way, the the smoke of, of smoking, uh, of that kind of letting your mind wander where it will go, um, in the way that uh, uh, there's a wonderful story, by the way, about Sir Walter Raleigh's challenged by uh, by the Queen. Uh, to say how much smoke weighs, to say uh, how much, s how much smoke weighs, and he takes a cigarette and he weighs it, and he smokes it and he weighs the ash, and the difference is the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but absolutely, but 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 that but that but that taste of letting your mind wander is, is absolutely certain. Now I mean you know this is very. Uh, I, I've been told that going to the Museum of Technology Stone is quite an experience. Okay. <laughs> on that note, <laughs> and on that note, the voice of authority. <laughs>